Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tom Banchoff. I'm director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs here at Georgetown. I'd like to invite you to our symposium on Dying for God, Martyrdom in Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. This event is being co-sponsored with the Prince Alwaleed bin Talal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding and uh, with the Program for Jewish Civilization. The Berkeley Center, uh, as many of you know, is really trying to explore the intersection of religion and world affairs. We're doing it in an interdisciplinary way, and we're doing it across traditions. And I think those three goals really resonate with the, the topic of today's symposium. Dying for God, dying within a tradition, for a tradition, through a tradition, clearly a topical issue in world affairs today. It's an interdisciplinary set of questions that brings in theology, ethics, history, and the social sciences. And of course, and I think this is one of the real contributions of the symposium, is a cross-traditional, multi-traditional issue. Uh, and it's an issue that is debated and has been debated for centuries within traditions as well. So with that brief introduction, I want to uh, introduce to you Paul Heck, my colleague in the, the Department of Theology, whose idea the symposium was, who's put in all the legwork and really brought together a wonderful set of panelists. So Paul, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you. So I'd just like to welcome you all again um, to this symposium. We have a, uh, we're very fortunate to have with us a group of scholars whose work represents the latest thinking on the topic, we have uh, Shmuel Shepkaru from the Department of History at the University of Oklahoma, and author of Jewish Martyrs in the Pagan and Christian World. We have Elizabeth Castelli from the Department of Rel Religion in Barnard College, author of Martyrdom and Memory, Early Christian Culture Making, and also David Cook from the Department of Religious Studies at Rice University, author of Martyrdom in Islam. And again, I'd just like to reiterate my gratitude for the generous support that we've received. I would like to thank the Berkeley Center for Religion, uh, Peace, and World Affairs, which has sponsored this event, and also, again, the Program for Jewish Civilization and the Center for Muslim Christian Understanding that has co-sponsored the event. Um, so just to give you a little bit of context, I'm just going to take a couple minutes, and then we'll get to the presentations. Uh, martyrdom, dying for God, is a hot topic. Uh, several important studies have appeared in recent years, and so I thought it would be a good idea uh, to make some of these scholarly insights available more generally. Uh, martyrdom has a long history. Um, in Judaism, the first instance of it goes back to the Maccabees. In Christianity, it is the foundational event, and it has featured prominently in Islam. Martyrdom, death for a cause, is, is by no means limited to the Abrahamic traditions, or even to religion, right? You have martyrs outside of religious traditions. But to get a handle on it, I thought it would be good to focus on these three traditions, the Abrahamic uh, religions. Why do people choose to die for God, and how is such a choice understood? I want to make it clear that we have no single theory, and there is such a variety of types of martyrdom that we are forced to examine the concrete circumstances of each case. And yet, there are noticeable patterns. And so I just want to give you some prompt, prompt questions. My, my students, a couple of whom are here, know that I, I like to give prompt questions in advance uh, to get you thinking about, about the presentations you're going to hear. So what purpose does martyrdom serve? Who, or rather what, defines a death as martyrdom as opposed to simply death? Is being a martyr about dying for beliefs related to the other world or for political goals in this one? Are there causal factors that encourage martyrdom? Can one die well in the fashion of a martyr, but for a wrong cause? Are there then false martyrs, and how are they distinguished from true ones? Is death for God a sign of piety or a sign of madness? Does martyrdom entail, actually entail actual death? After all, the word martyr simply implies witnessing, not dying per se. Can one then be a martyr without dying a violent death? 
So the presentations you're about to hear will shed light on these questions and I'm sure raise others. And I, and I hope all of you will, will come away from this uh, symposium with new insights about the persistent phenomenon of dying for God. So just a word on the format. We have two panels, each with two panelists. And so the panelists will speak one after the other. Um, and then we will open it up for questions. Uh, there will be plenty of time for questions. And then we'll break at 4 to 4.30 for coffee and informal discussion. And then at 4.30, we'll come back for the panel on martyrdom in Islam. So without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Shmuel Shepkuru, our first panelist, to address us on the Jewish aspects of martyrdom. Yes, please. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's it's a great pleasure to be here, and, and thank you for all the efforts, Paul, and uh, for the hospitality. Um, I, I'll address maybe one or two of your questions. Um, I'll try at least. Uh, and so, um, what motivates a person to willingly give up his or her life uh, is a perplexing question in any study of martyrdom. It is often assumed that the expectation of rewards beyond the grave plays a major role in the martyr's decision to embrace death. We often read that the link between martyrdom and reward has its roots in the Jewish tradition. And so in my talk today, I will focus on the relationship between martyrdom and reward. Uh, and by uh, doing so, I will point out some of the characteristics of Jewish martyrdom uh, and the um, evolution this concept underwent. We need to begin with uh, late antiquity uh, um, and uh, accounts of late, late antiquity and the early um, writings of the rabbis. Um, in these diverse sources, the fear of transgressing God's law emerged as the prime motivation for voluntary death. Indeed, the stories of the anonymous mother and her seven sons in 2nd Maccabees and in its uh, much later version from 4th Maccabees appear to present uh, an exception to which I will return shortly. But the consistent theme in the rest of the narratives involving the option of voluntary death remains the desire of the uh, individual to avert transgression in order to avoid God's fury in this life. A fear of transgression constitutes the prime reason for voluntary death in the story of Elazar, uh, Elazar described in 2nd Maccabees. This second century BC book describes how the officers of the king Greek Antiochus ordered Elazar to choose between uh, death and eating pork, and because Judaism uh, prohibits the consumption of pork, Elazar chose death in order to escape, quote, the vengeance of the Almighty. The fear of divine retribution is said to have propelled Jews to consider voluntary death during the Roman period. The historian, Joseph, uh, the historian Josephus Flavius reported that Jewish protesters refused <clears throat> to let the Roman governor Pontius Pilate erect Caesar's uh, images in Jerusalem. Rather than transgress, the peaceful protesters exposed their throats, uh, ready to be slain. Josephus ascribed similar statements to the peaceful protesters against the order of Emperor Caligula to install his images in the temple. When the Roman general Petronius attempted to carry out uh, Caligula's orders, Josephus reports, Thousands of Jews suggested the general to slay them to avoid forbidden acts. Philo of Alexandria, the Jewish philosopher and exegete, also provided an account of the conflict with Petronius. According to Philo, Jews were willing to die and even destroy themselves and their families um, to avoid transgression. Uh, and they did that even though, or they were ready to uh, sacrifice themselves, uh, even though they believe that the death, their death would end their existence. This nihilistic approach reflects also Philo's personal view. He departed for Rome to personally persuade Caligula to nullify his decree, although he was well aware that just the attempt might cost him his life. <clears throat> 
Yet, Philo wrote, so be it. We will die and be no more. Fortunately for these protesters, and perhaps for the entire Roman Empire, Caligula was assassinated in Rome, and his decree was never implemented. In most cases, therefore, we are dealing with stories of potential martyrdom. Expectation of rewards are missing in Josephus and Philo's reports. A more elaborate discussion on the benefits of voluntary death is offered by Josephus in his account of the 960 rebels <coughs> at the fortress of Mesada. <coughs> Excuse me. Initially, their leader, Elazar, failed to convince the group to follow, quote, the foreign Indian concept of self-destruction, uh, which argued for the survival of the soul. They found this argument for the immortality of the soul unconvincing. Eventually, it was their belief that it was God's will and of necessity that they should die. According to Josephus, they held that, quote, man's highest blessing is life and that death is a calamity, end quote. This discussion at Mesada mirrors a philosophical debate between two opposing views. One, the Roman fascination with altruistic death and their concept of immortality. And two, the biblical position that rewards and punishments are handed out in this life. The Hebrew Bible perceives death as a calamity because it terminates the relationship between the finite human being and the infinite living God. In the words of Psalm 115, 17, for instance, the dead do not praise Yah or God. Those who cannot praise him cannot benefit from him. As I mentioned, the story of the mother and her seven sons constitute an exception. King Antiochus is said to have executed the seven for refusing to worship him and eat pork. Their proclamations in 2 Maccabees contain their hope for physical resurrection. I think the emphasis should be on hope. Uh, using such terms uh, and notion in 2nd century BC, Judaism was a bit unusual. As I have argued elsewhere, I am inclined to suspect that the two stories of martyrdom in 2nd Maccabees are an interpolation of a later period. Strangely, the version of 4th Maccabees make, uh, makes no mention of physical resurrection. Instead, this uh, second century CE book tells that the seven brothers were received by the patriarch Abraham, living now before God. Excluding these atypical lines, the rest of the account corresponds with the general Jewish tenor of its period. The individual's fear of transgression constitutes the focal point of the account. How can these atypical lines be explained? Based on linguistic and thematic analysis, several scholars have classified these verses as a late addition to the text. In fact, some of the verses, some of these verses, do not exist in all the manuscripts. Uh, the concept and the language of these extra lines are reminiscent of Christian texts. Suffice here to mention the story of Lazarus, who was received by Abraham, or Revelation 7. Indeed, the Maccabean heroes became popular among the church fathers and received their day of celebration in the Christian calendar. Of great significance is the fact that the early rabbinic text, the text that shaped the future of Jewish theology, stripped the seven sons of the rewards mentioned in the Maccabean books. Neither resurrection nor immortality in heaven appears in the rabbinic versions of the brother's story. Moreover, one version insists that only God lives for all eternity while a human being lives today and is dead tomorrow. The absence of reward in the early rabbinic adaptations suggests two possibilities. One, the story of the seven sons that the rabbis knew did not include rewards. Or two, if the early narratives about the brothers did mention rewards, and by the second century CE they had, then the rabbis deliberately ignored them. Why? To support their view on martyrdom. What was the rabbinic view? <clears throat> 
It should be stressed that, the only, that only a few descriptions of rabbis undergoing martyrdom in the Roman period are provided by the Talmud, the collection of rabbinic writings that uh, makes up Jewish law. To be clear, no celestial reward is offered to these martyrs. For Rabbi Akiva, the paradigmatic martyr in Judaism, his ability to proclaim the prayer of the Shema while being tortured is in itself a reward. And so the Shema, the verse from Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, has become the ultimate martyrological cry in Judaism. In Akiva's story, only after the angels asked God such a Torah and such a reward did the divine voice declare that Akiva was destined to the world to come. Make no mistake, the world to come in rabbinic literature usually refers to a post-Messianic, ahistoric stage in this world where all the righteous are rewarded. The angel's question indicates that martyrdom could not guarantee even a great scholar like Akiva a place in the world to come. Akiva earned his position in the world to come because of his great knowledge of Torah, namely his great erudition in Jewish law. The irrelevancy of martyrdom for future rewards is demonstrated in another dialogue. When God gave the Torah to Moses, he also revealed to him the future of mankind. According to rabbinic tradition, um, after learning about Akiva's great scholarly aptitude, Moses eagerly awaited to hear Akiva's reward. God showed him Akiva's gruesome execution. Protesting, Moses cried, such is Torah and such is its reward. God responded, be silent for such is my decree. The martyrdom of Rabbi Simon and Rabbi Ishmael revolves around the same motif. Watching the execution of his colleague, Rabbi Ishmael cried, where is Torah and where is its reward? After the execution of the two, the angels complained, such a Torah and such is its reward. A divine voice responded, if I hear another such cry, I will return the world to desolation. Rabbi Elisha ben Abuya asked the same question after the execution of his colleague Rabbi Judah. And the answer, it seems as there is no reward and no resurrection of the dead. Thereafter, Elisha became a heretic. And note that the reward um, Elisha expected was resurrection. The same dilemma surfaced also in the martyrdom of Rabbi Hananiah ben Teradion. Jewish martyrology holds Teradion as one of its best archetypes. The Romans are said to have burned him alive with the Torah scroll for teaching scriptures in public. Witnessing her father's execution, Teradion's daughter cried out the familiar question, is this the Torah and is this its reward? But Teradion preferred that the fire made by men should consume him rather than a divine flame. Martyrdom was not seen as a positive opportunity for rewards. That Teradion did not perceive his execution as a sanguine event is made clear in another Talmudic account. In that account, Teradion considered his colleague, Rabbi Pirata, to be the fortunate of the two. Teradion predicted that Rabbi Pirata will be rescued even though the Romans arrested him on five charges, while Teradion will be arrested on one charge but will not be rescued. Another Talmudic account shows more interest in Teradion's post-mortem fate. Here we learn that even though Teradion was about to sacrifice his life, he still questioned whether he would have a place in the world to come. Typically, Rabbi Kisma answered with a question requiring more information. Only after Rabbi Kisma learned that Teradion had donated money to the poor did he elude that he may. What emerges from these early rabbinic accounts is that even the ultimate sacrifice could not assure a place in the world to come. Study of scriptures and good deeds are presented as the key to reserve a place in the world to come. But the world to come should never be taken for granted by anyone. Furthermore, the nature of the world uh, of the reward is not always clear. According to the uh, rabbis, even Moses, who learned from God the mysteries of the universe, did not know the characteristics of the world to come. In short, 
The Talmud presents voluntary death as the believer's last resort. Its function is to prevent transgressions and to maintain Jewish identity. Martyrdom alone could not assure a place in the world to come. What determines the rabbi's post-mortem fate was the way they lived life, not the way they exit life. The narratives also emphasize the passive nature of Jewish martyrdom. When forced to choose between transgression and death, the Talmud instructs to let oneself be slain. What comes into view is a rabbinic attempt to prevent martyrdom from becoming an attractive option. In the biblical vein, an unnatural death is still perceived as a negative, negative episode. Therefore, one cannot volunteer for martyrdom. As the rabbis instructed, no words of Torah should be mentioned in the name of a person who offers himself to be killed for the Torah. To write off a scholar's legacy was considered to be a horrifying punishment. Understandably, promoting rewards would have been counterproductive to the rabbinic attempt to establish a balance between the biblical regard for life, the sanctity of life, to use modern terms, and the emerging popularity of martyrdom. Lack of rewards marks also two medieval Hebrew accounts. A 10th century Hebrew epistle describes the first known case of Jewish martyrdom in Europe. It describes the self-sacrifice of three individuals from Otranto, Italy. Benefits are ascribed only to the living. The persecutions under the, Rom uh, the Byzantine Emperor Romanus ceased, attempts to burn the Torah scroll failed, and the community flourished. An early 11th century Hebrew account on uh, an endeavor made by King Robert of France to forcefully convert Jews bears many martyrological characteristics, but no reward is allocated for the martyrs. A dramatic change marks the writing of their predecessors a few decades later. Images of heavenly rewards abound in the Hebrew documents pertaining to the massacres of Franco-German Jews by the participants of the First Crusade in 1096. These chronicles designated all casualties as martyrs who received their eternal reward in heaven. In the interest of time, I will focus only on a few um, themes. As a sign of departure from tradition, a Hebrew liturgical poem warned not to question the destiny of the dead, called here um, redumim, literally those who sleep, um, for they have been destined for everlasting life. The world to come no longer implied terrestrial messianic period. In the medieval Hebrew account, it, it denotes a, classic, a celestial realm. There, all the casualties of crusaders' violence, now called the saintly, receive luxurious objects fit for European aristocracy. Golden thrones, crowns, necklaces, precious stones, you name it. Martyrdom no longer projects a misfortune. On the contrary, it is compared to a joyful wedding in which the martyrs become the bridegrooms and brides. More satisfying for the martyrs were, one, their heavenly reunion with deceased family and friends, their joining, uh, two, their joining of biblical heroes, the Maccabean martyrs and the Talmudic martyrs, now called the Ten Martyrs, or Rabbi Akiva and his associates, and three, the unthinkable, at least in Judaism, seeing God. This system, therefore, describes a theocentric and hierarchical heaven. God resides in the center. Around him are the seven sections of the saintly, each ranked above the other. The martyrs are placed on God's right. A few examples. The disturbing story of the young Sarit of Cologne describes how her would-be father-in-law placed her in, quote, the bosom of his son Abraham proclaiming, my daughter, come and lie in the bosom of Abraham, our ancestor, for in one moment you shall acquire your future 
and shall enter the circle of the saintly. Sarit was expected to achieve a place in the world to come, called here the bosom of Abraham. There, she will be reunited with the two Abrahams, the, the biblical Abraham and her medieval fiance. Particularly telling is the report of events in the northern town of Zanten. Anticipating the arrival of crusaders, the congregation is reported to have assembled for their last Sabbath meal. The leader, identified as the priest higher than his brethren, recommended self-sacrifice for a great recompense awaited them in heaven. There, they will see God eye to eye in his actual glory. They will be in the company of Rabbi Akiva and his associates. Each one will point at God with his finger. When the leader finished, the audience replied loudly with one voice, Amen, it is God's will, and destroyed themselves. Thus, we are told, they came before God rejoicing like a groom coming forth from the chamber. Examples such as this abound. The question is, how this new component of celestial reward in medieval Jewish martyrology can be explained? The answer lies in the Christian crusade narratives. Parallel examples of celestial rewards flourish in the Latin sources of the Crusades. Already in his famous call for the first crusade at Clermont, Pope Urban II stressed the importance of suffering, personal sacrifice, and celestial recompense. As the number of casualties increased, so did the imageries of heaven. The fallen crusaders are said to have received the same personal heavenly gifts mentioned by the Hebrew accounts golden seats, crowns, jewelry, and so on. And the rationale for becoming a martyr is also analogous, being with fellow crusaders in heaven, joining the highest heavenly rank of biblical heroes and past martyrs, and the ability to sit on God's right and see him, the visio dei, the beatific vision. Like the Hebrew poem that warned not to consider the sleeping ones dead, Emperor Alexius had written in the same language not to consider the crusader casualties as dead. The captured crusader Reynold received his place in Abraham's bosom for choosing martyrdom over conversion to Islam. And finally, the scene of the Jews in Zanten echoes the speech of Pope Urban at Clermont. By the phrase, a priest higher than his brethren, the Jewish leader at Zanten, who eventually the text identifies as a rabbi, was made parallel to Pope Urban, the most famous highest priest of the period. The Sabbath meal at Zanten is reminiscent of the Last Supper, which will open the gates of paradise for its participants. And the Jewish reply in one voice, it is God's will at Zanten, is the exact crusader reply in one voice to Pope Urban's call at Clermont. Altogether, the Jewish and the Christian accounts paint almost an identical theocentric and hierarchical martyr's heaven. But uh, while medieval Christian authors could and did turn to past martyrologies and hagiographies for inspiration, no such internal apparatus was avail available for the medieval Jewish authors. They must have been inspired, therefore, by their Christian environment. The question is, what convinced medieval Jews to include these images in their accounts now? The answer that comes to mind is the need to rationalize the massacre of over 5,000 Jews during the first two months of the First Crusade. Martyrdom and heavenly recompense were, me were meant to turn tragedy into triumph, defeat into victory, a victory that even the Crusaders couldn't prevent. But the imagery reveals also its polemical nature. Medieval Jewish martyrologies reacted to Crusaders' propaganda. For the Crusaders, the holy military campaign 
was presented as a form of martyrdom and as a vehicle through which all Christians and only Christians could achieve a place in heaven. Perhaps the most hyperbolic statement in this regard belongs to Humbert of Romance. Being defeated in the wars with Islam repeatedly, he wrote that the aim of Christianity was not to fill earth, but to fill heaven. Only by death endured for God could Christians make their way to heaven immediately. While Christians believed that their martyrs never died, they argued that Jews, Muslims, and heretics remained in death. European Jews were fully aware of these Christian views. Jewish accounts quoted the Crusaders proclaiming the hope for an ex exclusive Christian uh, paradise as their motivation for joining the Crusades. Reality forced Jews to acknowledge their predicament, but they could not let their Christian contemporaries deprive the Jewish casualties of a religious victory. As long as such Christian views continued to claim a monopoly on heaven, their Jewish contemporaries persisted in incorporating into their own martyrologies the very same notions that their um, adversaries refused to share. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shmuel. I think that presentation really, I think, gives some food for thought about um, how new political and cultural circumstances can trigger new concepts of martyrdom in a single religious tradition, uh, and, and certainly, as you showed, uh, new concepts of the, of the rewards uh, of martyrdom. Um, and I'm sure there'll be many questions for you. Um, let us now turn um, to the sister religion, uh, Christianity, and Elizabeth Costelli will uh, address us on Christian aspects of martyrdom. Good afternoon. Um, I want to thank um, Paul Heck for inviting me to be here and uh, the Berkeley Center for uh, sponsoring this event. And it's nice that you all are here as well. Um, my presentation is not going to be exhaustive. If we were to talk about all the Christian martyr stories, we would be here into the night. Um, but what I want to do is divide my presentation into three parts. To start by talking a bit about the early Christian martyrological discourse as it emerges from the earliest sources that we have, and to think about how that lends a kind of scaffolding or structure to um, later understandings and reiterations of, of martyrdom in the Christian tradition. The second thing I want to do is to talk about how early Christian martyrs travel culturally and so turn up in unlikely places. And I have a particular example that I want to raise um, um, to talk about in regard to that. And then I want to close just with a few very general reflections on the, the staying power of the figure of the martyr more broadly, um, since we're trying to talk across traditions and, um, and look for both commonalities and differences, I thought that maybe to think a little bit about, um, I, I don't quite want to use the word the archetype of the martyr, but something like that, um, to think about why it is that we keep coming back to this, um, this kind of framing of uh, human religious expression. Um, if Christianity didn't actually invent martyrdom, it most certainly distinguishes itself by being a religious tradition whose roots are firmly planted in the experience and commemoration of death for others. Christians from the earliest generations onward found a compelling articulation of their circumstances in narratives of persecution and redemptive suffering. And I want to be clear um, on this point that I'm not making the claim that all Christians were persecuted. And indeed, one of the paradoxes that my own research has dealt with is the fact that um, the, the evidence that we have, especially for early Christianity, suggests that very few Christians actually experienced persecution. But nevertheless, the story of persecution becomes a kind of framing device for self-understanding and Christian identity. Starting with the New Testament, the, the authors of the various texts in the New Testament often shaped a mythic framework for meaningful suffering and developed the raw material of self-fulfilling prophecy in repeating predictions of persecutions to come. The Apostle Paul, for example, interprets the death of Jesus as an expiatory sacrifice 
for others. And he draws here both upon available models of suffering for others and also provides a template for later theorizing about Christian martyrdom. Moreover, Paul himself makes use of the authority that accrues to him because of his own imprisonment by Roman authorities, laying the groundwork for a complex martyrological tradition that would accrue to him in the decades and centuries after his death. The Gospel of Mark, the earliest of the four canonical Gospels, offers a narrative of martyrdom, that is, the telling of the story of the death of Jesus as a martyrdom, to which later Christians would attach their identifications and emulations. The first purported history of the church, the two volumes in the New Testament, um, the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles, makes predictions of persecution an organizing feature of the triumphant story that it told. Meanwhile, the gruesome portraits of righteous suffering and vindication in the book of Revelation wrote the story of Christian suffering within the broadest framework imaginable, setting historical experiences in cosmic terms. The New Testament thereby provided an interpretive framework for Christians who came afterward to constitute the meaningfulness of bodily suffering and to trace in it the contours of their own self-understanding and self-identity. By the early part of the second century, we find ourselves confronted by an emergent discourse of Christian martyrdom, grounded less in shared experience, because of, as I've already pointed out, most Christians were not the victims of persecution, grounded less in shared experience than in shared conviction about Christian identity involving innocent suffering. The point is made most singularly by Ignatius of Antioch, a Christian bishop who is under arrest and being escorted to Rome to be executed. As he travels west, he writes letters to various Christian communities, including to the church at Rome, whose members he fears will seek to use their influence or their money to try to extract him from his circumstances. To these well-meaning if misguided Christians, he writes the following. I'm writing to all the churches and I give injunctions to all people that I am dying for God's sake if you do not hinder it. I beseech you, be not an unseasonable kindness to me. Suffer me to be eaten by the beasts through whom I can attain to God. I am God's wheat and I am ground by the teeth of wild beasts that I may become the pure bread of Christ. Rather entice the wild beasts that they may become my tomb and leave no trace of my body, that when I fall asleep, I be not burdensome to any. Then shall I be truly a disciple of Jesus Christ when the world shall not even see my body. Beseech Christ on my behalf that I may be found a sacrifice through these instruments. A passage like this one brings us in some respects to the heart of a certain modality of Christian martyrdom, an absolutism, a deep-seated conviction, an insistence that the suffering body serves as the vehicle for spiritual transformation. Yet many scholars have had an anxious and uncomfortable relationship with this famous paragraph, struggling with psychologizing language and diagnostic terminology in their attempts to cope with Ignatius's apparent zeal and psychic excess. The eager way in which he speaks of the tortures confronting him shows an abnormal mentality, asserts one scholar. Ignatius is, quote, highly strung, even neurotic, claims another, while yet another observes, quote, his language sometimes betrays an exuberance and wildness, which could be interpreted as neurotic. And yet another scholar diagnoses the bishop's state of mind as, quote, exaltation bordering on mania. Through the use of such language, writers have displayed their own ambivalences about the religious commitments that drive Ignatius. And they have distanced themselves from the self inscribed in the discourse of this soon to be martyr. And yet the passage by Ignatius contains the seeds of the martyrological tradition for future generations of Christians links between the suffering body of the martyr and the lofty aims to which that suffering reaches, attainment to the divine, becoming a disciple of Christ, 
rendering one's own corporeality a willing sacrifice to God. Moreover, as Ignatius urges the Roman church to remain silent, that he might be rendered a word of God, he positions himself in what will become the quintessential martyr's pose by engaging in a radical, set, a radical act of bodily compliance his radical cooperation with the will of his oppressors becomes an act of total resistance. A century after Ignatius, another Christian prepared for an ignominious death in the arena, this time a young woman in North Africa, Perpetua of Carthage. The text that preserves her story, The Martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas, has anyone read Martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas? Only a very few, oh, rush out. You must. Um, this text has acquired particular fame because of its structure and its contents. Framed by a narrative written in a third person voice is a first person narrative which has long been read as Perpetua's prison diary. As one of the few witnesses to women's writing in early Christianity, the martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas has been widely anthologized and analyzed by those seeking to reclaim some fragments of Christian women's history in this early period. Likely the most famous part of the Perpetua text is the last of the four visions that she narrates in her diary. And the shape of the diary is it begins with her being in prison with these other catechumens. And she um, repeatedly requests visions from God and receives them. And she's portrayed very much as a person who's in control of her spiritual um, life, even though she um, is rather new to the Christian movement. So she can, um, she asks for a vision, she receives the vision, and she interprets it correctly immediately, right? So she's uh, kind of spiritual vir virtuoso. In the fourth of these visions, she has a vision of herself being led into um, a public space, into an athletic context with a person she describes as a, a giant Egyptian. Um, and this is a very common feature of early Christian literature that figures of the demonic are figured either as Egyptians or as Ethiopians. And there's a long literature on why that might be. Um, but in any case, she's led into, the, into this space to engage in this athletic contest. Two young men come up and strip her clothes off of her to prepare her for this contest, which will occur in the nude. And she then declares within the vision, um, as her clothes were stripped off, she says, suddenly I became a man. And she proceeds to engage in this athletic contest. She um, is the victor in the contest. And her interpretation is that she knows now that she will be victorious, that she will go to her death in the arena and um, be led to what, what she describes as the gate of life um, so that she will um, die and, as a consequence, live. And then she writes, um, let him who will write of it tell the rest of the story. And then the narrator goes ahead and does that. Um, this scene tells us several things about the emergent understanding of martyrdom. Martyrdom staged as a contest or an agon. The martyr figured as a triumphant athlete of Christ. The spectacular character of martyrdom itself, an event staged to be seen. And the complex role that gender ideology offers to the analysis of the workings of power in early Christianity. And Perpetua is one of the first of a whole series of early Christian women whose spiritual virtuosity is figured by their abandonment of, of feminine gender and their taking on um, the characteristics of masculinity. Um, part of this is a play on um, the Greek term for courage, which is Andrea, which is literally masculinity, right? And so um, because she's so courageous, she becomes a man. And there's, we could have a long conversation about um, the complex malleability of gender in this um, case and in others. Um, these couple of examples, and I could go on with many others, but I, I want to emphasize several themes that grow out of them that I think are significant for thinking about how the early Christian martyrological discourse um, contributes to a more um, broad sensibility about martyrdom um, in the Christian tradition, but even um, beyond that. Um, the first that I want to emphasize is that I view martyrdom largely as a discursive project. That is to say, that um, it's a, a, a narrative way of making sense of something that has happened, rather than something that one enters into in necessarily a conscious way. So that many different kinds of um, acts of violence can be read in many different sorts of ways. And what I would argue is that in 
um, in the Christian tradition, certainly, that the, the discourse of martyrdom is about making sense of death and making meaning out of meaninglessness. And so um, I would even go so far as to make the argument that what the Gospel of Mark is doing in framing the death of Jesus as a martyrdom is in, in a way, oh, for this author and for his community, making sense of the senselessness and the um, atrocity that that death represented to this community. And so it becomes a kind of ex post facto way of making meaning. Um, the second thing that I would draw out of these examples is the centrality of the audience for martyrdom. That is to say that um, martyrdom functioning as a public witnessing, um, a public action that gets read by others. And so martyrdom is not only about the person who is suffering the violence, but also about those who look on it, right, and interpret it and make sense of it. Um, in the moment and afterwards. Um, and so its reception is critically important and how it gets repeated and retold is critically important for how martyrdom gets produced. Um, and, and from these early examples moving into the tradition um, subsequently, one of the most striking things that one can see in stories of, early, of Christian martyrdom across the tradition is the, what becomes an almost kind of formulaic way of telling the story, a certain kind of narrative repetition that I would argue emerges out of this early kind of scaffolding that gets established by early Christian martyr stories and then subsequent stories um, interact with that scaffolding and sort of um, hang their narrative de details upon them. So there is this kind of uh, production of an existing interpretive framework into which empirical details can be uh, positioned. And some of those details will be fragmentary, some of them might be contradictory, but they then the, the scaffolding itself gives them a kind of shape and structure. Okay. so. That's my first piece of my presentation, is just to give you a little bit um, to think about from, from the early Christian tradition. Um, the second thing that I want to turn to is, is perhaps a, a bit of an unlikely example, and it's um, to think about how the figure of early Christian martyrdom turns up in unlikely places in more contemporary um, situations as a way of making an argument about power. Um, and the example that I want to use is this image, and I brought you some. I think I might have enough. I have 50 copies. Would you, can I just take one? Thanks. Could you distribute those? Um, the example is a photograph that appeared on the cover of Esquire magazine in April of 1968. And I'll just hold it up to here while it's coming around. It's over here. Um, it's a photograph in which Muhammad Ali was posed as the early Christian saint, Saint Sebastian, in an ironic quotation of the Italian Renaissance painting that appears on the right side of the handout, uh, a painting now attributed to um, the Renaissance painter Francesco di Giovanni Botticini, a, painter, a painting of the Roman soldier turned Christian martyr, Saint Sebastian. In the photograph, as you can see, Ali is dressed in his boxing costume, and his torso and right thigh are pierced bloodily with arrows. His head tilts upward in a saintly and suffering angle, reminiscent of countless passion scenes from the repertoire of European painting. Quoting the iconography of Saint Sebastian, whose legend celebrates the martyrdom of an imperial soldier who, because of his religious convictions, refuses to fight, the Esquire cover effectively framed Muhammad Ali's conscientious objection to service in the US military in martyrological terms, and more specifically, in Christian martyrological terms. The cover glosses a story that was still unfolding in April 1968. There are some people in the room, I think, who are um, mature enough to remember this story, but others, perhaps, of you don't. And so let me tell you a little bit about the story. Four years um, earlier, so in 1964, Ali, who uh, at the time was going by his given name, Cassius Clay, had been classified uh, one Y by a Kentucky military draft board, a classification that would have resulted in the indefinite deferral of his military service because he had scored too low on the Army's aptitude tests. Between March 1964 and February 1966, Cassius Clay converted to the Nation of Islam and changed his name twice, first to Cassius X and then to Muhammad Ali. 
In February 1966, his military classification was changed by that same draft board from 1Y to 1A, fit for service. In April 1967, Ali famously refused induction into the US military, citing his con consciousness as a Muslim minister and his personal convictions. I've searched my conscience, he said, and I find I cannot be true to my belief in my religion by accepting such a call. The Selective Service rejected his claim to conscientious objector status, in part by calling into question the legitimacy of the Nation of Islam as an authentic religion. As a result, he was charged, tried, and convicted of draft evasion, stripped of his world heavyweight boxing title, and sent into a kind of cultural exile. Ali had already, by May 1966, become the object of intense scrutiny by the federal government, including covert wiretaps and other forms of surveillance under the orders of the FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover. Eventually, his conviction would be overturned by the Supreme Court in 1971, but in 1968, when this Esquire cover appeared, Ali was in professional exile and under threat of imprisonment for his anti-war stance. The April 1968 cover of Esquire is framed by this broad context. Now I want to tell you a little bit about the story of how this cover came into being, because it's quite an interesting story. Um, the Esquire cover was the brainchild of a Madison Avenue ad man named George Lois. Lois has recently recounted the story of the portrait's creation in his photographic memoir, Celebrity. And in an interview published in a magazine in 2005, uh, the magazine is called Stop Smiling, and the issue was specifically devoted to the sport of boxing. Um, while Cassius Clay turned Muhammad Ali was experiencing his meteoric rise in boxing, his conversion to Islam, and his prosecution by the US government, George Lois was an innovator in the world of advertising, who had been producing provocative covers for Esquire since the early 1960s. One of his most famous covers, I think, is the image of um, uh, Lieutenant Calley um, from the My Lai Massacre, um, smiling broadly with several Vietnamese children in his embrace. It's a really stark cover and unclear how Lois actually got him to take the picture. In any case, Lois approached Ali with the idea of photographing him as Saint Sebastian. Lois brought with him to the meeting with Ali a postcard from the Metropolitan Museum of Art that reproduced the late 15th century Italian portrait of Sebastian's martyrdom, and you have it here on your handout. Um, there are, if you, I mean, you've probably seen various images of Sebastian, even if you didn't quite know who he was, um, because this is a, a, a constant piece of iconography from the Renaissance onwards, and it's been used in a, a variety of ways that we could, we could talk about. Um, in Lois's account of his negotiation with Ali, Ali examined the Renaissance portrait very carefully and then exclaimed, hey, George, this cat's a Christian. What followed <clears throat> was a telephone negotiation with Elijah Muhammad, the founder and leader of the Nation of Islam, who ultimately gave his permission for the image to be created by photographer Carl Fisher. In the Stop Smiling interview published in March 2005, Lois describes the process by which the shot came to be staged. While it was being set up, Ali jokingly pointed to the various arrows that were affixed to his torso, naming each of them, Lyndon Johnson, General Westmoreland, Robert McNamara, and other members of the President's cabinet. The photograph of Ali on the cover of Esquire in spring 1968 came to serve as a potent pop culture critique of US involvement in the war in Southeast Asia and a graphic articulation of the high costs paid by some, at least, for their resistance to that war. Culturally, Ali straddled a complicated insider-outsider divide, an American hero for his boxing record, but an African-American and a Muslim who endured many years of surveillance by J. Edgar Hoover's FBI. The Esquire photograph recirculated a widely recognized and nearly canonical image of early Christian martyrdom in a new pop art idiom, using an ancient Christian story in the service of an ongoing political struggle. The photograph itself, as it appeared on the cover of Esquire, acted as a heated provocation within the cultural debate in US politics. It brought together in a single icon arguments about race, religion, militarism, political resistance, and its costs. It did so through a complex series of artistic gestures, citations, analogies, and juxtapositions. Sebastian and Ali had both literally fought their ways into position of influence in societies with imperial structures or aspirations. Sebastian in the Roman Imperial Guard, 
Ali in the center ring of the boxing, of boxing celebrity in the US in the 1960s. Yet each has only a provisional claim on his position of privilege, conditional upon participating in reigning structures of military and political constraint. Both figures suffer real or metaphorical exile for their religious convictions. And according to the iconography that grows up around his story, Sebastian bears the price of his conviction in his arrow-pierced body. Both Sebastian and Ali are soldiers who, because of religious conviction, refuse to fight in the service of their respective empires. By posing Ali as Sebastian, George Lois placed a highly provocative image in play inside an already contentious debate being waged within American society about militarism, conscientious objection, and political dissent around the Vietnam War. And there are many more examples that we could um, draw even just from the Sebastian image itself. It, it's a very mobile image. It's been, it was picked up um, in the um, 1980s in particular by the, the AIDS activist movement where Sebastian is figured as a patron saint of um, gay men suffering from AIDS and you know, lots of other kinds of examples like that. But I, just, I wanted to just bring one that we could look at more carefully to so get a little bit of the flavor of some of this translation of these early Christian um, martyr stories into a broader kind of political domain. And if we have time, we could talk about uh, a whole range of other ways in which um, ideas of Christian martyrdom have been deployed in um, contemporary political fields. Here, this is an example of um, political dissent. More recently in American culture, we've seen some of the ways that the language of religious persecution has been used by the political right to, I would argue, um, silence dissent. And so the, the language of the war on Christians, for example, in the American context is, I think, a deployment of the early Christian um, scaffolding um, of martyrdom for making a political argument in a rather different domain. Okay, the last point that I want to make just very briefly is, or, or set of issues that I want to discuss um, has to do with the, the lasting character of the figure of the martyr and, and maybe to provoke a little bit of discussion among all of us about why we think that um, martyrdom um, hangs on in the ways that it does culturally and politically and religiously and what it is that is so powerful um, about it, even as it involves a certain level of ambivalence on many people's parts as they encounter it. That it's not for me to say whether these people are true martyrs or false martyrs. It's not because I'm not the audience in a, in a certain respect for the actions that are taking place. And so, um, but I, what I saw in the anxiety that the question evoked was this um, desire for me, the expert in martyrdom, to put to protect martyrdom as a category, right, and to put it in its place, so that we could say we know, you know, that this is true and correct and proper, and then we can um, declare these other things that are happening illegitimate and wrong and and challenged. And there, so there's this whole kind of ambivalence that circulates around um, the 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 category itself. And I just wanted to um, close then with a, a quotation that. Um, from a text that I actually quote in the epilogue to the book, um, where I was trying to get at something about the ambivalence and the anxiety that martyrdom inspires, even as it also inspires a kind of desire and attraction. And there's sort of a both andness that is part of um, the engagement with, with martyrdom. And this is a quotation from um, the philosopher Kierkegaard, who is making what I think is a very haunting and provocative comparison between the martyr on the one hand and the tyrant on the other, and finding a point of commonality between them. This is the quotation. The first form of rulers in the world were the tyrants. The last will be the martyrs. In the world's evolution, this is the movement from worldliness to religiousness. No doubt there is an infinite difference between a tyrant and a martyr. Yet, they have one thing in common, compulsion. The tyrant himself with a craving for power compels by force. The martyr in himself unconditionally obedient to God compels through his own suffering. So the tyrant dies and his rule is over. The martyr dies and his rule begins. So I want to leave you with that quotation and I look forward to our discussion together. <laughs>
Thank you, uh, Elizabeth, for that wonderful presentation. I think you really uh, touched on the idea how it is the community that, that defines its martyrs um, in a kind of ex post facto, and, then, and yet the image of the martyr then becomes something for a culture at large and kind of recurs as a focal point for various cultural battles and, and anxieties. So, so um, thank you. Um, yeah, now we can open it up for discussion. We've heard two different um, presentations, and, and I think we've got uh, 20 minutes or 30 minutes almost for for um, questions. I'm sure there'll be many questions. We have a microphone uh, coming around uh, to record your uh, questions, so please use it. And maybe those of you who have questions, uh, once I've acknowledged you, then you can then stand up and, and say who you are and, and your affiliation. Um, and we'll begin with you. Yes, sir. Uh, Stanley Cope from Georgetown, I'm now with the Cato Institute. It seems to me that martyrdom falls into three categories, and the third one was just touched on at the end. The first would be the martyrs who kill themselves, but nobody else, say, um, the Jews of Messiah. The second category would be soldiers who kill themselves knowingly when they attack other targets, the kamikaze of the Second World War. The third would be those who kill themselves, but rationalize the killing of innocents in the process. The innocents can be bystanders, or they could be the targets themselves, the September 11th attacks. Is there any indication of how people or traditions might progress from one to the other in these different types of martyr? Is this addressed to? I, I, I will add one more group of martyrs who let others kill them. Uh, and, and I think that's how martyrdom appears in Judaism and I think also in Christianity, just that's the genesis of martyrdom and that's what makes, I think, martyrdom so uh, perplexing and so disturbing, especially uh, if you think of the Roman period, such, such a violent period where the hero of the period is, is the fighter or the glad, gladiator and here you have a group of people who, who won't fight back. Um, so, so I, I would uh, add this uh, group of people first. Um, and then we go into the question of definition. When you talk about Mesada, I'm reluctant to call them martyrs. Um, I, I'm reluctant to believe the story to begin with, but uh, <laughs> that's something else. Um, um, and, and one more. Well, I'll try to answer your question. I don't think we can predict uh, behavior, uh, but I think one key in, in helping us predict uh, changes and evolution of concept in the case of martyrdom would be the nature of persecution or how people perceived their persecution or, or uh, violence towards them. Uh, and I think if we keep in mind that martyrdom is presented as a reaction to a condition, we have to start with the, the condition that triggers the reaction. But I don't know if we can answer the question. Elizabeth, did you want to I, I'm not sure that I can answer your question either. I think that, um, well, I, I agree with everything that Shamil has said. I also would add to it, I think, um, that one of the the two elements that I think we need to keep in play in our conversation is um, is the language of will or desire and the capacity of um, some people to subsume their will to that of another and in the process turn, turn the tables in some way. And the other term that I would want to keep in play here is power and the, and the competition over um, power that is embedded in um, many stories of martyrdom. So that, you know, when you think about, just in sort of common parlance, when people are talking about a situation where um, they don't, it, it's a struggle over um, either a legal question or a political question. And one of the elements in the struggle can be, well, we want to be careful. We don't want to make a martyr of that person, right? Well, we all kind of know what that means, but you know, it would be interesting to kind of parse that. You know, what that means is you don't want the person to, in some sense, upstage the set of claims that the people who are saying we don't want to make a martyr, that person want to remain dominant, 
right? And so there's there's an interesting and complicated sort of power struggle that's going on in any time the language of martyrdom is used. And, and I think that one way to answer your question would be to think about how power works differently in each of those different examples and think about when is power being um, exercised, when is it being asserted, when is it being um, uh, reconfigured um, through an action that, that perhaps turns the tables, perhaps does something else. Dan Vladimir, uh, Sean, I was wondering about the figure of uh, Samson. Mm -hmm. Is he ever uh, examined in the rabbinic literature in, in these kind of categories? No, not as a martyr. No, no. I, I, I can give you another example, and that would be uh, King Saul. Um, and there are three versions in the Bible. Uh, about King Saul's death. In one, he fell on the sword. On the, uh, in another version, uh, he asked his, uh, his assistant, his uh, armor bearer, to kill him. Um, and then they have, you have the version with the Am Amalekite boy who, who uh, uh, kills him at the end. Um, the, the rabbis preferred this, the version that claimed that he was killed and not the version that he killed himself. Um, and I think in order to support or uh, to ignore uh, the version that um, considered active self-killing. They, they, they were not comfortable with self-killing. Question of reward: um, If there's no heavenly reward given, um, how about the reward of your contemporaries who, or the people who come after you, who then look at you as, well, somewhat heroic for having given your life for for the cause of the faith? And I mean, in both, I mean, in both presentations, I saw the element of um, sort of a pedagogic element in dying, so that people who come after you will stick to the faith, right? It's a teaching tool on some level. So there's reward given to the people who die by recognizing their, their deed. Um, and then the other question I had is, to what degree both of you are familiar with sources, early sources that already spoke to each other, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, about martyrdom. Were there any early interdisciplinary panels on this? <laughs> is trying to discourage uh, martyrdom in general. Uh, and there is a tension in the story of martyrdom in Judaism, at least in the time of the early, the early stories. Um, and the writers are very uncomfortable. And I presented one side of the story, but you have other stories related to these heroes, these martyrs, uh, where the martyrdom is actually linked to a, a scene that they committed in their, in their lives. And, and so you have the uh, ambivalence here. You have two sides of the same coin. On the one hand, they are, yes, they're heroes, of course. They died for their conviction. They died for, for God. Um, yes, I think you can say that. Uh, but uh, the other side of the coin is that something was wrong here, because the general view of, of the Jews, at least based on the Bible, is that death implied uh, an unnatural death or an early death imply the transgression. So the the most famous one well, maybe the most famous uh, martyr in Judaism, Rabbi Tiradion, in another martyrological account, you find that his martyrdom was actually a punishment, a divine punishment for pronouncing the name of God in his fullness, in, in other words, Yahweh, which Jews are not supposed to do. Um, Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Simon, uh, while being executed, they were wondering uh, what happened, what went wrong, and they raised the possibility that they, that they didn't treat the poor and the widows properly. So maybe that was a punishment for, for ignoring the needs of, of the weak in society. 
And so you always have these uh, ambivalent feelings in the story. On the one hand, yes, they are heroes, of course, they deserve uh, uh, recognition. Uh, but uh, at the same time, there is this uh, feeling that martyrdom might be also a punishment. And actually, we talked about it uh, during lunch. Uh, there is the famous story, the most famous story probably in Jewish martyrology, and that's the story of the Ten Martyrs. It's a story that um, a Jew still uh, read on, uh, on Yom Kippur, the holiest day in the Jewish calendar. Uh, and the story starts with an original scene, the, the transgression uh, that the brothers of uh, uh, Joseph had committed by selling him to, uh, to the Egyptians or the uh, Ishmaelites, if then what the Persians are reading. And so there is always, you always see the involvement of sin in the story of martyrdom, of a personal sin, or an original sin. So, yeah, and I don't remember what was the second question. Oh. Um, the closest thing I can think of is just the ways that early Christians, and my early Christians are earlier than Islam, so um, <clears throat> um, the way they took up the map and they enlarged. Um, or invented. In event, well, okay, I'll do that part if you want to. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that that story um, became a, one of the templates for, for Christian martyrs, and, and especially the mother in the back of the other story ends up being a very important figure for Christian Ahmed Rahim, uh, State Department. Uh, I was intrigued with your comparison uh, in looking at how martyrdom was used and uh, adapted in the context of the Vietnam War, and, and uh, it sort of got me to think about sort of the context of martyrdom and secularism. I mean, what, what it brought to mind is sort of the Republican revolutions in the Arab world in the 50s and 60s, and how they used the uh, theme of martyrdom, martyrdom for the nation. I mean, these were socialist, secular regimes which employed the language of martyrdom. And I wonder in the, um, in the context of the US and perhaps in, in Israel, uh, 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 within the Christian and Jewish tradition, <coughs> whether there is a kind of parallel where secular states use the language of the market. Don Smith, um, unaffiliated. Uh, Elizabeth, for you, uh, when you presented the, uh, the picture of Ignatius, uh, it seemed to me that my understanding, I guess, of the early Christian period is that it's much more diverse than that. Um, you, you have people who are volunteering uh, to go to the, to, the, to the beast. You have people who will wait and some who will run away. So you get somebody like Clement to Augustine will be a different trajectory than 
nations. I wonder if you could say something about that diversity. And I guess the other thing would be in that in that general context of Plato and Plotinus, of is there do you see any connection between sort of the 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 Platonic view of the particular and the form and and the, the world and heaven for the early the early Christians. Okay. That last one's kind of a bigger question. Okay. So can I stick with the first one? Stick with the first one. Okay. If I could have another one for the second one then just in the, in the idea of voluntary death. Uh -huh. Would it be fair to say that in the period of the I would want to take it maybe from Socrates to Augustine, but in that period the whole discussion within the church of voluntary death, uh, so we're afraid to use the word suicide, but voluntary death was much more open uh, than it is after Augustine, of course. Um, you're right that in my choosing Ignatius as an example, it was a little bit of provocation, because it's just such a great task. You know? uh, but you're right that, of course, there's great diversity um, there. We have. Um, a great debate even among the, the church fathers at the time about um, just how voluntary it was supposed to be. Right? And so interesting evidence where there is um, Clement is one, Origen is another, who write to Christians and say, um, you know, if you're if you you know turn yourself in and get martyred, don't think that you're gonna get the martyr's rewards because it doesn't count, then it's suicide, right? If you're arrested and you know there's no you know and you're charged and, and this is an inevitability, then you have to accept your fate. But for the people who are who are a little bit too enthusiastic, you know, um, they are troubled by that. I they don't actually write about Ignatius. I'm not sure they they know his letter when, when they're writing. It'd be interesting to think about how Clement and Origen would respond to Ignatius's um, exuberance. Um, but I also, the other thing that I wanted to mention in relation to that, that I think is a very important point to make, and it's um, one that I make when I teach about martyrdom, is that you know the the general picture of early Christian experience is you know all persecution all the time, which is just not true. Um, even when we get to the first systematic so-called persecution of Christians in the mid third century with the um, Decree of Decius, where the Roman emperor declares that he's trying to he's trying to pull this disparate empire together. And so what he says is, oh, the way to do that is to get everybody to do the same thing religiously. So everybody's going to have to sacrifice to the gods. And not only do you have to sacrifice to the gods, but you have to get a, a receipt that you did it. And we actually have some of these receipts left from antiquity, uh, where people, you know, I so and so do things sacrifice to the gods. Right? Um, What's so interesting about this particular moment in Christian history is the vast majority of the Christian evidence at this point is not about how you know hundreds and thousands of Christians went to their deaths, but how hundreds of thousands of Christian hundreds and thousands of people that many hundreds and thousands um, either you know became apostates or you know ran away or you know and, and in fact the bishop. Um, the, the North African Bishop Cyprian is a major player in the story, and he's sitting in a cave somewhere writing letters to Christians saying, I know it doesn't really look good that I'm not on the front lines here going to my martyrdom, but it's really important that I'm sitting here in my cave encouraging you all. You know, so um, you know, so we have in, in this important example sort of where the tide turns in, in Roman imperial policy, um, more evidence of Christians not Testifying for their faith, but rather figuring, you know, paying someone else to go do the sacrifice and get them the receipt, or running away, or just doing the sacrifice, or whatever. And then it becomes a huge issue for the church about what to do once there are all these people who have um, recanted. And so, um, how do you bring them back into the fold? And, and it actually produces a major schism in North Africa because there are some people who are saying, you know, if you sacrifice to the Roman gods, you have to be baptized again. Right? And um, other people say, you know, baptism is once and for all, and, and it's irresolvable, and we have the, the reverse position um, ending up splitting off from the church. And so um, your point about these great varieties, I think, is very important. Thank you. Great hey, and I'm a theology uh, teacher, theology in this department in uh, Georgetown. Uh, I wanted to pick up on the last question and trying to figure out what is about this denial of the body and denial of life itself that 
sort of proposes the martyr to uh, choose death over either transgression or life itself. And especially in the case of women and the, um, the acts of perpetual felicitas, uh, one of them had just given birth to a baby. I don't remember if it was perpetual or perpetual. Perpetual, I think. Yeah. And, pregnant. and she was even offered by her father to be delivered from that situation. And she refused. And I was wondering what, on what basis would they choose, sort of consciously, death over the possibility of nourishing life and perpetuating life, even uh, if that met maybe uh, at least temporarily denying their their faith. Mm -hmm. And what was propulsing them to do that? What was the motivation behind it? It wasn't fear, I think, as uh, um, Dr. Shepa Sh Sh who um, said, but I really think there was a, a motivation of a, a tremendous denial. I can't quite call that love. And I was wondering what you feel about that. I think in the, in the logic of the story, I, I can't presume to discern the psychology of anyone, um, even myself. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I think in the logic of early Christian martyrdom, it's not choosing death, it's choosing life. Right? And that this life is death. And death gives you entree into everlasting life. So, you know, it's, it's an overturning of, of all the systems of meaning. It's just, it's a reversal. And so, um, you know, and I, uh, it's interesting because when I teach Perpetua, oftentimes my students really identify with the baby, you know, in the story. It's like, she left the baby, you know, and, um, and get really upset about that and, you know, what, what a bad mother she is. And, um, and yeah, she's a bad mother. Um, but, um, but, you know, part of the way the story is working is, you know, she's leaving everything of, of this ordinary, continuing life behind. You know, she's, she's abandoning her role as a daughter. She's abandoning her role as a mother. And, and ultimately, with that last vision, she is abandoning um, conventional gender identity as well. So she, she's stripping off all the, the, the womanness, right, um, to get to that kind of pure subjectivity that it gets bigger as possibility count, but, um, but so it's, you know, at the level of the text itself, it's, it's about this peeling these things off, but it's not an embrace, I mean, it, I can see how one could read any of these stories as an embrace of death, but I think that that's not how the people who either might have lived these kinds of experiences or narrated them understand it. I think that it's really about an inversion of the understanding. We have time for one more brief question, if there is one. Um, yes. Um, I'm a global leader, I'm just a question here. I just wondered, um, someone mentioned the issue of suicide, and there's a quote that just came to mind that part of them is just suicide with more press coverage. Um, and I was wondering, if just you discussed the issue of the audience and just any examples or how much of them has been used in terms of propaganda and whether or not there's ever been a difference between, you know, an authoritative use of the martyrdom versus people and how if that's ever created a schism and just results to that. Can you say about an authoritative use? Like just um just how a state might use it or how an authority figure might use a martyrdom versus the acceptance of the people in different audiences views of a martyrdom and even change over time how that might it views of suicide. So. Well, I, I guess I would, the way I would answer this would be with, with an example that isn't about a suicide, but it's about um, a state of violence and multiple interpretations of that, of that violence. Um, when Timothy McVeigh was executed for the Oklahoma City bombing. There was, there were great pains exerted by various people involved in that execution um, as they were going through the ritual of execution, which is a kind of a ritual, to declare repeatedly, this is not a martyrdom, this is not a martyrdom, this is not a martyrdom. And 
Um, it, I was very struck, I was you know, following the press coverage of it at, at the time. You know, what was, I mean, I understand what's at stake in wanting to declare that act of state violence you know, a simple you know, execution of justice and the execution of this person. Um, but what is also very striking is that it doesn't matter how much the state or the news media or whoever says this is not a murder because they don't get to decide if it's a murder. They can assert it all they want, but if there are going to be people you know, in the white supremacist world who are going to read um, Timothy Clay's death as a murder, they're going to do that with whatever the, you know, the state or the newspaper tells them about it. So, and, and I think that that, you know, it, it's that kind of dynamic that happens a lot, that it's about um, who, whose authority is going to be the most persuasive. You know, in that particular situation, it was already um, a standoff between you know, two very uh, strongly competing uh, framings of authority. Thank you. We're going to have to take a break there. Are already many rich issues have been raised, and we're only halfway through the symposium. But please join me in thanking both Elizabeth and Shmuel. For their